and to know how you love us. Thank you, Lord. We devote this service to you, all aspects of it, this morning. The word from Peter, the music, our prayers, just our full attention to you. Thank you, God, for meeting us where we're at, right here. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll please stand with us this morning, and if someone could get the lights for us, that would be great.
come this morning just as we are in this place. And thank you for accepting us just as we are. And what can we do for you, Lord, but to worship you in spirit and in truth with our whole hearts? When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply
those times where God's been really faithful. It's hard to count all the times. We have so much to be thankful for. that were at retreat know this song and some of you don't and I hesitated to throw a new song at you but it's so powerful at retreat we talk so much about Jesus coming back he's our bridegroom and I know that might feel a little weird for the guys but he is our bridegroom he's coming back for his perfect bride and he is beautiful I, I, I keep picturing him coming in clouds and all his glory and I can't imagine anything more beautiful and powerful. So this is a really simple song, but I want to worship our Savior, Yeshua, our bridegroom. My beloved is the most beautiful among
in the word, in the music, in our fellowship together. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Children are dismissed. I'm glad we were able to sing those songs uh, that we did because it's so in line with the uh, uh, message that I think God is bringing to us today, and Sharice and I haven't talked all week. That's not true. <laughs> I wish I hadn't talked to her. She wish she hadn't talked to me, but she has no idea what I'm going to talk about, and I have no idea what song she chose, but it's neat to see how God brings those things together. Uh, and I'm glad that as a body of believers, we get to be here and Keep our focus where our focus really needs to be as children of God, and that's on his kingdom, his righteousness, his glory. We especially need that in a world that is dark, in a world that's hopeless. And to me, if we as believers can't have hope in a time like this, and I don't mean just a fluffy, smiley face kind of hope. I mean a real solid hope. If we don't have that kind of hope now, then what good are we? What good are we? I mean, we'd be just like the rest of the world, right? We'd be moping around, we'd be cursing, we'd be, you know, talking about everything that's going along, along that's bad. So I'm glad we have a time like this as believers to encourage each other, to remind each other so that we go out there and live the life God wants us to live as his children. 
because that's what he's designed us for. And you know what? He's caused us to live in a dark world. He's caused us to live in a broken world. We've come from brokenness. Many of us are still broken, but at least we have a hope of someone who's doing something more than what we could ever do it ourselves. One of the things I have not done that I ever remember, and I'm just gonna to touch briefly on it today because I want us to be aware of something. Typically, I haven't talked about things like the, the, the celebrations we have in the, in the Christian realm, like we celebrate Christmas. Well, it's highly unlikely that Jesus was actually born at the time we celebrate Christmas. Very, very unlikely that's the case, but that doesn't matter. We redeem that time. You know, Easter, you know, Easter we know was a pagan religion, but we as believers have taken it over and we redeem that time. And I think that's important. We're celebrating Halloween today. Halloween is, uh, comes at, the, at All Saints Day. And, and I just want to say something about Halloween, and I don't want to get real specific about this, but this is something I've really been aware of. And the reason I want to bring it up is I really believe we need to be praying this day. Most of you, many of you may be shocked to hear this, and in fact, many of you may be absolutely disbelieving what I'm about to say. Because typically, this is the kind of stuff I don't talk about, and I think rightly so. But during this day, Halloween truly is the most high day in the world of darkness, in the satanic world. Okay, and, and we Christians sometimes go around spouting out things we don't know about, and it makes us look ludicrous. I am not concerned about us giving candies and whatever else we give to people, and please don't give me any because I don't need them. Okay, but I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with giving, you know, if, if children come to your door and giving them stuff. I think that's okay because it's part of the culture we live in. But I think, I think part of the way we redeem this vacation, this day, Halloween, is by prayer. Why? Very specifically, I want to say this. Because this is the most high day in the satanic realm. Some of you may find it very, very hard to believe, but this day, hundreds of thousands of little babies are going to be sacrificed on the altar to the satanic. And they're going to be sacrificed in ways that you cannot imagine. I'm not going to talk about it out here. If you are interested, I'll talk to you before. 40 years ago when I ran into this, 40 years ago when I ran into breeders, and breeders are young girls who typically hit puberty and then are purposely bred to bring forth babies at the end of September, beginning of October, whenever Halloween comes. And they're bred specifically for the sacrifice of that child. And it's done year after year after year. And they are required to participate in that sacrifice. So many of them have never spoken out. Some of them become Christian. The trauma they go through is horrible. This is real. You don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe it. It is true. This evening, there will be hundreds of thousands of babies, not just in America, around the world that are sacrificed, killed, their lives taken. I know they're going to be with the Lord. Why is that? Because the darkness needs blood to power it. Why? Because they mimic what we have, the blood of the Lord Jesus. So when I say that, when I say that, I'm not saying don't be nice to the kids that come to your door. Don't kick them and scream them and yell at them. Please don't do that. But pray. Pray for those people. And you know what's really encouraging to me? Very, very rarely, well, those who are sacrificed are never going to be able to speak, right? Those who are involved in sacrifices actually come out especially the young women, and, and they become older, many of them will not speak because if they speak, they will be killed. And they will be killed, and they are killed. Because one of the things about the demonic, they keep everything in darkness, and you're not allowed to speak about it. But what's interesting, in fact, this last week, it's so in, uh, I heard a number of young women in England, not believers. They're not followers of Jesus. But they have finally said, enough is enough. We're going to speak. And it's very, very rare for non-believers to speak about this. I went through seminar training 35 years ago under someone 
from one of the national three level agencies who talked to law enforcement and those of us as therapists. And they talked about this. They talked about what to look at, to, to, to be aware of. They talked about what to, to, to kind of be aware of with what was going on. And they were so frightened, they did not let their name be used because they were so frightened of being killed by the Satanists who were in high powers. The reason I say that is please today, please today pray. Because there's going to be a lot of suffering, but a lot of suffering is going to be by those who will live tomorrow and live the next day and live after that. Human sacrifice has never disappeared from this world, never. Human sacrifice is still real and it's still very, very real in our country. And you can hide your head if you want, but don't. Let's be a church that prays, okay? Because we're a people of hope. God's given us hope. I do not believe our time here, at some point I think it may be important for me to discuss some of the things that go on in darkness, but today is not that time. Today is just pray. Pray, 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 because we have good news. And I'm going to focus and shift on the good news that we have because we need to be people of hope. Hope is a good thing. Hope is what God has designed us for. Even in a dark world, hope is what he's wanted us for. Now, at the, end of, at the end of services, there's always a benediction, or typically there's a benediction, right? And one of the most common benedictions that is given, has been given since the, since the birth of the church, comes from the, the, the last verse of uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul's writing to the 2 Corinthians. And let me read the passage at the end of his letter to the, second Cor to the, the church at Corinth. The, Paul wrote two letters to the church of Corinth. The first letter was a church had everything, but they were so messed up. The things that went on in the church were unbelievable. Even people outside the church in this new this new budding religion, Christianity, weren't, people were even amazed at the stuff that was going on inside the church. It was so horrible. So Paul was addressing that. Why? Because Paul was the father. Paul was the one who founded that. People came to know the Lord. The foundation of the church at Corinth came from Paul. A year later, he wrote 2 Corinthians. And he followed up on a few of the things that he talked about in the first letter to the church, and he was going to come to visit them, but he wanted to address a number of other issues. And he talked here about people who were coming in who were trying to discredit him because they wanted to be super apostles. They wanted the church to abandon Paul and the basic teachings that Paul had given and to follow them because they were enlightened. They saw new things. They were aware of new things that old man Paul didn't know about. Kind of like the church today oftentimes, right? You don't want to teach what's in Scripture. You don't want to teach what people have heard. Why? Because we got new stuff. We have new insights. It's amazing to me how there are so many people who aren't even followers of Jesus who have these tremendous insights now about Scripture that none of the previous generations ever saw. It's like, really? Isn't that what we call arrogance? Because who's in charge of the church? The Lord Jesus is in charge of the church. Now, the Lord Jesus may not be in charge of a fellowship. The Lord Jesus may not be in charge of a, a, a denomination. Whether it be Presbyterian, United Methodist, you know, uh, uh, Catholic, uh, whatever. The Lord Jesus may not be in charge of that. But the fact is, as far as the church, the followers of Jesus, the Lord Jesus is in charge. He really is in charge. And that's a good thing. And so let me read you, come to the end, because Paul has said some pretty rough things to them in this second letter, because he's defending himself. And I, he says, I feel like a fool that I have to defend myself. I feel so foolish, but I have to defend myself for your sake, that you don't get pulled off by these false teachers and what they're teaching. I want you to know the truth, the foundational truth that line Jesus Christ. And he ends off by saying this, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to uh, begin with verse 11. Yeah, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, by the word, that word in the Greek is siblings. And siblings aren't just brothers, right? Siblings are also sisters. So, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice and for aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace 
will be with you. And then he says to greet each other in the traditional ways, greet, greet each other with a holy kiss, which most of us don't understand. It's like, you're kidding me, right? Don't, don't come be coming in close to me and kiss me, right? No, don't do that, <laughs> please, right? But there it was like the Arab kiss, mm, 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 or the French kiss, or the Swiss kiss, whatever. But then go on, verse 14. The grace, and this is the verse we're going to look at, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We're going to look at each one of those three little phrases because I think it's important. So we're going to start off with the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Helsby, uh, he was a Norwegian. That's why he has the name Oli. Oli Helsby was his name, right? And he, he was uh, over 100 years ago. And he said this, and I love this. Just picture this, this the, 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 listen to the words and picture what he's saying. The air which our body requires envelops us on every hand. The air which our soul needs also envelops us, all of us, at all times and on all sides. God is round about us in Christ on every hand and with his many-sided with his many-sided and all-sufficient grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just again, some of you, if you get tired. Bear with me, because I'm never going to try to say this. The grace of the Lord Jesus isn't something that he gives. The grace of the Lord Jesus is something that he is. Grace is part of him and flows out of him. And when we think of grace, we think of being gracious. Grace is a whole lot more than just being gracious. Grace has to do, first of all, with the fact is the recipient of grace is undeserved. But not only are we undeserving of the grace of God, we're also, we can't gain it. It's unmerited. Grace is unmerited. Jesus Christ is the essence of grace. He lives out who he is, and that is word that we use in scripture for him is grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Think about that. When do you deserve grace? When do you deserve grace? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Never. When do you need grace? Always always need grace. Sometimes we're more aware of the, our need for grace. Other times we are not so aware because things are going well. We still need grace. An amazing thing about his grace is whether we're aware of it or not, his grace is always there, just like the air around us. Yeah, he's always there. His grace is always offered to us. Listen to what Paul wrote earlier in this letter in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And again, I'm sorry, we don't have notes, but we will next week or next couple of weeks. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And for those of us who are children of God, those of us who have received the grace that was manifested on that cross, there's a richness to us in our inheritance that goes way beyond what anybody in this world can imagine. We're children of the Most High God, and one day it will be revealed what that means. Right now we live in hope, but one day it's going to be real. It's going to be manifest. By the way, this grace also is not given chinsely. It is given freely. Why is it given freely? Because it emanates from who he is. A couple of weeks ago, I was going through one of our local stores, 
And I was very pleased with myself. Why? Because the person behind the counter was rude. The person behind the counter was obnoxious. I don't know what was going on in her life, but she was just not nice. And I was so gracious. I was so kind. I didn't even think bad thoughts about her. I didn't act in a bad way. I was so gracious, and I was so pleased with myself. You know what that's like, right? Because you know what it's like how you feel about yourself if someone acts that way and then you act that way and you get out of the car it's like, oh, God, I shouldn't have acted that way. But you did. So it's nice sometimes to be happy that we've been gracious. That is not what God's, that's not what Jesus Christ's grace is like. <laughs> because, you see, I had a choice to be gracious or not. Jesus, by his very nature, is grace. And his grace is always extended. For many of us, we either take it for granted because thing in, things in life are going good or we run away from it because we know we don't deserve it. When do we need grace the most when we don't deserve it? That woman that I encountered needed real grace. She was having a bad day. I have no idea why. She was having a bad day. She really needed grace. Lots of people could have come and yelled at her and probably did or act, you know, meh, you know, uppity towards her. And I understand that, but she needed grace. When you're down, when you're hurting, when you feel like a schmuck, when inside yourself you feel yuck about yourself, you need grace. And the fact is this, as close as the air is to you, and it's always there with you because you're always breathing, the grace of God is even more real because that is eternal. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, the grace giver. The free gift of God, it is forever. John wrote, or, or John quoted Jesus said this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That is grace. Why? Because as our big brother, as our savior, I'm sure there's times we act, if we acted towards each other the way we act towards him, it's like, get lost. I don't want you, I don't want people to know you're my brother. I don't want a person to know you're my sister. Why don't you live on the other side of the earth? Get away from me. You know what I'm talking about, right? We're even that way with our kids sometimes. Oh, we're certainly that way with our parents many times. For those who are younger or we look back, because we always, of course we knew more than our parents. Our parents were stupid. <laughs> Everybody knows parents are stupid. Until we become parents. And then we go back and we feel so bad about how we treated them. We feel bad because they may have been very inappropriate, but things were going on in their lives we didn't know anything about. By the way, not to make an excuse, but the reality is that's not the way Jesus is. He's always there for us. Nobody is going to snatch you out of my hand. You belong to me. That's the grace of the Lord Jesus. And the cool thing about his grace is this. He can't but give grace the way he gives grace. And you know what that's like? Abundantly. I can measure my grace. I can decide, well, you only need a level three grace today because of you act. Or if it's my birthday, I'll give you a level 10 grace because I mean, you are so good to me on my birthday. Jesus can't do that. Jesus is only one way to give grace. And that grace is absolutely, totally, abundantly. Again, quoting John as he describes the Lord Jesus, uh, John 1, 16, for from his fullness, the fullness of the Lord Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. One more grace after another grace after another grace. For the law was given through Moses. And by the way, the Jews loved the law. The Jews loved the law. Not because they followed it, but it's their treasure. The law belongs to us as a nation. The law was their treasure. And he said, as, treasuring, as, as wonderful a treasure as the law is, he said this, 
For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. So compared to the law, the law is dimmed. Like we looked at last year, last year, it seems like last year, last week. Where the glory of the Lord Jesus far, far supersedes the glory of the law. And it's like the law has no glory in it when you see it in the light of the one who is glorious. So the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. What does that mean for you as you go through this week? What does that mean for you as you sit here right now? What does that mean for you as you look at your life? It doesn't mean that you smack yourself and say, well, I'm so stupid because I don't accept this or I don't believe it or I'm not receiving it. Don't do that. Ask yourself the questions. Do I need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if I realize I need it, then all I have to say to him, I don't understand any of this. I don't fully, I can't comprehend you as God because you are amazing as God, but I need your grace and thank you that you are the grace giver. Because you see, it's by faith that we receive this grace. grace. By faith, we accept this grace. It's not by feelings. It's not how emotionally I feel, because when you feel really bad, you know you need grace, but you don't exactly feel emotionally drawn to grace, because you feel bad. But grace is, receive it, it's all around you. So the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Now let's go to the next one. And the love of God be with you. God is called the God of grace, too. And by the way, Father, Son, Spirit is our God. Three persons, one God. And Paul's giving the, 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 the reality that the Trinity is there for you. All of God is there for you. There's no aspect of God that's not there for you. God really is for you. I just want to say one more thing uh, before, before I come to the love of God, and that's about grace. It's hard for us, and people oftentimes say, how can a loving God send people to hell, eternal damnation? How can a loving God do that? A loving God never designed hell for humanity. Hell were for those angels that were living in his presence, that knew him, for Lucifer, the light bearer, his main angel that saw God says, I can be like you. I want to be like you. I took a third of the angels out of heaven to follow him. That's who hell was created for. And those who are their followers are going to end up in hell. Those who are not willing to receive the reality of God. I mean, it would be, it's so interesting. People don't want to have a, they don't give a damn about God. And yet when they, when they die, it's, oh, they're in heaven. They're entertaining God. They're making God laugh. Oh, they're, 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 they're going to just spark up heaven. They're going to put heaven in order. It's like, what kind of bunk is that? You have nothing to do with God now? And you want to live in his presence? It's like, I can't stand Rex. <laughs> Rex knows I love him. I pat him because his face all of a sudden went down. It's like, I can't stand Rex. I want nothing to do with Rex. In fact, I hate Rex oftentimes. I ignore Rex. But yet one day when Rex becomes a multi-multi-billionaire, I'm going to be his best buddy and live with him. Are you friggin' kidding me? Because it's not Rex that I care for. And I forget who it is. I may have been C.S. Lewis, but, I, but, I, but whoever said this, I absolutely agree with it. You know, a person that has nothing to do with God now would be extremely uncomfortable living in the presence of God. And it's God's grace that they don't have to live eternity with him. It is God's grace that he's not going to force them to live with him. I may have said this last week. You know, I probably did. But I thought it was such a cool idea, I thought I'd say it again. A person who does not like God, who does not believe in God, who has nothing to do with God, who fights against even the reality that there may be a God, a person in that state 
when they see God, God is far, far, far more terrifying than the deepest blackness because he is God. And that person will want to go to the depth of hell to get away from God. Think about that. God is awesome. God is majestic. God is a burning fire. And if you're not comfortable in his presence, if we haven't accepted the grace and love, we don't want to be with him. Think of yourself being forced to spend the rest of your life with someone you can't stand. Wouldn't that be hell? Wouldn't that be hell? And God's going to force everybody that can't stand him to live with him? I don't think so. Because the grace of the Lord Jesus extends into eternity. We're never going to get beyond the grace of the Lord Jesus. So the grace of the Lord Jesus now be with you all. But the love of God the Father now be with you all. The love of God be with you all. Again, understand, God does not have to love because God is love. It's his nature. If there were no God, there would be no love. There is love because there is God. And God is living out his nature. And Paul here, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this. I want you, Corinthians, you're a group that is really messed up a lot. You're struggling. You still don't have it right. You're still being pulled off by others. But I want you to know that not only the grace of the Lord Jesus, but the love of God go with you, be with you. The love of God is with you. Isn't that an incredible thought? Isn't that incredible thought? C.S. Lewis said something that I really, really like because I think it puts things in perspective. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said. On the whole, God's love for us is a much safer subject to think about than our love for him. Makes sense, doesn't it? God's love for us is a far better thing to focus, to concentrate, to think about than our love for him. Because our love for him as our love for anybody else is come up and down, up and down. We may love somebody, but the emotion isn't always there. We may love somebody, but we ain't always act that way. The love of God is consistent. Jesus said this, John 4, 1 John 4, 7. I mean, uh, Paul, John said this, 1 John 4, 7. God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And who did God give the son for? Those of us who are his enemies. Those of us who are broken, those of us who aren't going to amount to much. We have a number of coaches uh, of different sports right here in this congregation. And you're a coach, and you've got to choose your team. Are you going to choose the person that has absolutely no ability? The person that can't jump, can't run, isn't strong, don't have the moves, can't shoot baskets, can't throw a ball, can't receive a ball, can't block. Would you really choose a loser to be on your team, to be your varsity team member? Of course not. You'd be a lousy coach if you did that. Ah, oh, but God's so much different. God chooses us who are like that. And he says, you, I want you to be mine. You, I love you. You will become more and more who I've created you to be, regardless of how the world has torn you apart. Regardless of how shattered you are. There is no breakage that is so strong that God can't put it back together again. We were helping Howie and Sharice yesterday. Well, I was there observing everybody help Howie and Sharice move yesterday. Great team, by the way. Thank you guys who all went out there. That was wonderful. And so I, because I'm not doing much, I just stand around looking, right? 
And I noticed that one of the windows of their cars are broken, it's shattered. And I had to get something or look at something in the car, so I opened it and I closed it and more of it fell down. After a while it was fun, I just opened and closed, open and closed, open and <laughs> You know, all these little shreds of windows fell down, it's great. You don't have any more windows there, by the way. You may want to cover it up before. But I mean, open, close, open, close. And it was like, a listen to it tinkle as a glass broke. And I would look at the, and then the sun hits it and it shines. Well, that's great, let's do it again. Boom, and there it goes, right? That wasn't hard for me to do, by the way. That was very, plus it was very enjoyable. <laughs> but you know what's amazing, besides this bug flying around? What's so amazing is this, that God can take every single one of those pieces of that window and put it back together and make a window that was more wonderful than what it was actually designed to be. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's who God is. All of us have regrets in life. All of us regret things that are done to us. We regret things that we've done. We regret choices we made. We regret choices other people have made. All of us live with that. But God says, you know, come to me, trust me, live in my love, and I can make that all what I design for you to be and for your life to be. As long as you have the breath of life, you are not lost. Now, we know it's a journey. The completion actually is going to happen in heaven. But you know what? It's not a matter of going along around this world like Eeyore, hands in the pocket or stinky, you know, with a big little thing over the head, you know, and everybody keeps away because of stench. Is it stinky or? Pig pen. Oh, pig pen. <laughs> pig pen. So I call it pig pen stinky because pig pen and stinky kind of go along together, okay? Obviously, I had, I wasn't brought up in this country, so I lost a lot in translation. But anyways, <laughs> but the fact is, some of us still live our lives like that when the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus is upon us. And part of the reason is, number one, we don't believe it. Number two, we don't receive it. If we don't believe it, we're not going to receive it. And by the way, to receive it, oftentimes we have to walk with each other. That's why fellowships are really important. The most important thing of a fellowship is not what we do here today. This is important because God called us to get together, to sing praises. Very, very important. That is an important part of the, uh, of the service. To get together and listen to the word. Get together and pray as we're going to do in just a while. Get together and participate in communion like we will do next week. That's important. But it's more important that we live with each other, to encourage each other in this, that we understand that we live in the grace of God. Because you see, like, like that window that, that was busted, when God puts it back together, you see, nothing can hinder God's design for your life when you surrender to his love. Amen. Nothing can hinder that. Because after all, God is God. Satan isn't God. Satan does the lack of everything that there is of God. I never turn on darkness. I turn on the lights. Because darkness, you don't turn on. I can get a flashlight. And no matter how dark it is, even a weak flashlight is like, wow, that's a lot of light. God is light. Isaiah 41. And again, the amazing thing about Isaiah, Isaiah was talking to a rebellious nation, the nation of Judah down south. And so rebellious that he said, you know, God's going to punish you. You're going to go into exile. You're going into captivity. God is going to do that. But all the way through, God gives Isaiah encouragement for his people. <clears throat> Listen to Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. <laughs> he was even with them in captivity. Fear not, for I am with you. <clears throat> Be not dismayed, for I am, I am your God. You've left me. You've deserted me. You've chosen other idols to be your God. You have committed adultery. You have divorced me as your husband. I will not. Uh, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. 
I am the one who helps you. And he said this to a child that was disobedient. And they were going to reap the consequences of that disobedience, but still words of encouragement. So when we say the love of God be with you, we're talking about this love. We're talking about this God. So when's he not God? Never. He's always God. Like the air we breathe. In fact, he is beyond the air we breathe because at some point in creation, this air was, was created. At some point, when the new heavens and new earth comes, I don't know what it's going to be like as far as the chemical makeup of creation, but I do know that all the old is going to disappear on, and, and all the new is going to come. And for many of us who are trying to help out yesterday, he's like, thank God. You know, I mean, boy, you should see how we take a tumble yesterday. And I was talking, I think it was to Marvin. And Marvin and I said, if we had taken a tumble like that, we would have had broken bones. And we wouldn't have been able to move for the, a week or two. But Howie is a young, strapping man, right? Holy so, Spirit. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's definitely there with you because you could have broken your neck the way you took that tumble yesterday. But the fact is that God is with us. God sustains us. God upholds us no matter where we're at. And that's why Jeremiah, the crying prophet, said this, Let him who boasts, boast in this, I Jer Jeremiah 9, 23, Let him who boasts, boast in this, <clears throat> that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declare, declares the Lord. And one of the things as I was reading that, I was thinking, <clears throat> You know, many of us have prayed that God would expose darkness for a number of years now. God is exposing darkness. An amazing thing is exposing darkness in places that we didn't even realize darkness existed. But that's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because when God exposes darkness, it's because he wants to deal with darkness. So take hope. We have to be people of hope. We're not talking about politics. We're not talking about philosophy. We're talking about the reality of a living God who still is in charge of earth, or this earth. He's a God who loves righteousness. He's a God who loves justice. And he's a God who loves. And that'll never change. And the neat thing about that is because God is eternal, that love for us is never going to change. Isn't that amazing? God's eternal love will never change for us. Never. Psalms, a writer of Psalms 103. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him, those who stand in awe of him. As high as the heavens are above the earth. So how high are the heavens above the earth? So great is his steadfast love. So how do you feel? What's going on in your life? What's happening in your life? The grace of the Lord Jesus is with you and is there for you. The love of God is there with you, is there for you. Wow, that's pretty amazing. But that's not complete. Because then it goes on to the third part. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of God his own person, the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit isn't a ghost. He isn't just some power. He isn't just some ooh, 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 well, kind of thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's, he is a he, not an it. Casper is an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. He is with us. He is the person of God who lives in us, who has joined himself to us. He is the one who's inseparably given us life, but then he is our life. Jesus made an amazing statement. Now, I want you to listen to this, a very familiar statement. Just before he went to the cross, he was teaching his disciples the last little bit of teaching before he went to the cross. It's in John 14, beginning at verse 15. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Ever. And by the way, when does forever stop? Well, when you die. Are you kidding me? Forever is forever. 
The Holy Spirit, that third person of the Godhead, who has attached himself to you, will be with you, will be in you, will be joined with you forever. What an amazing thought. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Fellowship means a communion. Fellowship means a dialogue. Fellowship means an interaction. All of us right now have family. We love or don't love them, it doesn't matter. We have family and we have friends somewhere else in, in this vicinity in our, or around the world. doesn't matter. But right now, unless you're on text, uh, unless you're texting them, you're not in communication with them. And thankfully, rightly so. Can you imagine everybody sitting here texting while the message is going on or while we're saying texting, texting, texting? I mean, we're here to focus on God. The Holy Spirit is never busy texting the next person that he can't be fully with you. He fellowships with you forever. How does that happen? I have no idea how that happens. He is God. How can he be God overseeing the entire universe and entire creation, much of which we know nothing about? We don't, I'm sure there's dimensions we are totally unaware of. Our minds can't grasp it. How can he be in charge of all that, yet still intimately in charge of your life? Intimately involved with every cell of your body. Intimately involved in giving you breath. I don't understand that. But this Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you forever. God wants us to know that. And what I'm so glad about is that his fellowship with me is far more important than my fellowship with him. Because my fellowship with him ebbs and flows, depends on what kind of a night I had, depends on what kind of day I had, depends on who I ran into, depends on my physical condition. But his fellowship with me never stops. And by faith, I can receive that because faith is the organ of receiving what God's offering us. The Lord Jesus is offering us grace. God is offering us love. And the Holy Spirit is offering us fellowship. Fellowship with himself, fellowship with the Godhead. And by the way, that's why, and, and you've known this, whether it be in a church, and it certainly can, and that def definitely happens in church too, right? But it also happens with people. They say something that sounds right, but something inside of you says, yeah, there's something not right about that. There's a discernment. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you. Fellowshipping with you and says, be careful. And you may not be able to tear it apart at that point and say, what's not right about it? But something inside of you just kind of knows there's something not right. That's the Holy Spirit. And he's protecting you. He's guarding you. He's guiding you. Isn't that wonderful? And he will guide us into all truth. Let me give you a real simple truth, okay? A simple truth is this. That you have to have wheels that go around in circles to have a vehicle, to have a car. Let's talk about a car. You can have a three-wheeled car some places in Asia and Europe have three-wheeled car, but most typically it's four-wheeled car, right? So you have four wheels. Those wheels have got to turn around. No, wow, those wheels are there so the car can turn around. But you know what? Take four wheels and put them under a wreck that you find in the field. Put them just under, put them there. There's a wreck sitting on the ground. Put them underneath there and put them there and say, okay, that's a car. Drivable car. Are you kidding me? That car is going nowhere. It's sitting on four wheels. It's not going anywhere. Why? Because those four wheels need to have a power source. So the drive shaft and everything involved with the drive system has to do that. Oh, that's a new development. That's wonderful. So now we know that there's a drive shaft. That's a wonderful thing to know about, right? Is that the whole story? <laughs> you know it's not. There's got to be a transmission mechanism there to transfer a certain power from a certain way into another power in another way to get it going. And one of you are mechanics who are laughing at me the way I'm describing it because I'm not mechanical. <laughs> but I know that much. Something here turns to make this turn to make them turn. Oh, now we know another truth. But you know what? That's not the whole truth, is it? Because you need an engine running to make a transmission work. 
Now we know even more. We may not understand engines, but now we know more. But you know what? Now you have this perfect car, a perfect engine, perfect transmission, perfect tires, well aired, everything else. Well, good. That's it. No, it's not it. Why? Because it needs to be a power source. There needs to be gas. There needs to be you know, oil. There needs to be diesel. There needs to be something in there to make it run. Oh, so now we have another piece of information. Yeah, we do. That's wonderful, right? It's not enough. Why? Somebody had to create the fuel that goes into that. Somebody had to create the mechanism to get the fuel, to produce the fuel, to pump the fuel that you need for that. You see how revelation constantly goes? And ultimately, and let me, let me just kind of bring this briefly to us as people. Ultimately, we know that there, we know that there needs to be human beings involved to make all of this happen, right? If there's no human beings, this does not happen, at least not now. So let's go on this rabbit trail of, so what makes human beings go? And you can see how we can go on forever with this, right? Because revelation is ongoing. Truth is ongoing. There's more. How do you think we'll ever come to the end of understanding God? God allows us to see certain things. God allows us to have insight. God allows us to experience certain things. But that's just the beginning of God. And this one who has fellowship with you is the one who will guide you into all truth. Isn't that amazing? And he wants into all truth. He wants to convict you of sin because that's a wonderful job. If I'm doing something wrong and I don't know I'm doing something wrong and it's, and it's something that's separating me from God, how awful for the Holy Spirit not to convict me of the fact that I'm doing something wrong. The very conviction of me is the very thing that makes me want to get right with God. But it's also the one that allows me to enjoy the fellowship there. I oftentimes thinking, think, you know, Thanksgiving meals are typically a time of celebration. Okay, so we're all sitting around. <laughs> Can you, I mean, just picture this. Can you imagine being at a Thanksgiving meal where everybody who gathers together is purposely, purposely being called to gather together because you can't stand each other? Now you have a whole group of people who can't stand each other. Now you're going to eat a Thanksgiving meal with a bunch of people who can't stand each other. I mean, we've occasionally been in rooms with somebody that we don't particularly like, a family member or a, an old aunt or somebody that, you know, we have a hard time with. But can you imagine us all getting together with everybody there being someone you can't stand? What a horror. You see, and that horror really is the picture of the world. But God says, I am preparing a meal. It's much, much, much bigger than Thanksgiving meal. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. And I'm getting you all ready to sit down and enjoy me and enjoy each other. Whose job is that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in us, very, very real. Though I don't see the Son, I know He lives. Though I've never seen the Father, I know the Father because the Son has revealed the Father. Though I don't have never seen the Holy Spirit, He lives in me. God, Father, Son, and Spirit is there for you. Isn't that an amazing thought? And if we, and by the way, I know I'm speaking here, and I've had time to sit and think about this, so I get really overjoyed, more than delighted, overjoyed at this reality. I encourage you to think about this reality. Go to the last verse of 2 Corinthians and think about that. God is for you. And he's the one in this journey, last point, who gives us the power and the protection to live this life in enemy territory, a dangerous world, to continue to keep our eyes on him. He's the one that does that. Very first part, Acts 1.18. But you will receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit isn't involved in our lives. There is no power. It could be a lot of information, but information is not power. Last verse from Romans, and, and it's one of the verse that many of us love because it's such a verse of assurance. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts know what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That's Romans 8, 26 and 27. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. We have someone interceding for us when we don't even know how to intercede for ourselves. We have someone who's directing our steps when we have no idea how to direct our own steps. We have someone, you know, and the thing is, we say, well, that's true for Christians. It's very, very true for Christians. But, you know, none of us would have come to know the Lord unless the Holy Spirit had guided us to the Lord. Because the things of God are foolishness to the world. The Holy Spirit had to make them real, had to give us a desire, a yearning. And we either say yes and receive it, or we say, no, that's a bunch of bunk. Leonard Ravenhill, Ravenhill, I really loved him. He, he's passed away a number of years ago, several, a couple of decades ago, I think. I uh, was, a, was a Southern Baptist preacher, teacher, wonderful, wonderful man, a real man of God. And he said this about prayer, but when you think of what prayer is, prayer is communion, right? Prayer isn't something you do. Prayer is an interaction you have. Oftentimes, we forget that. Prayer is close your eyes, Hold your hands, bow your heads, and this is the word sequence you got to use. It's not what prayer is. Prayer is talking to God. You can talk to God like this. You can talk to God like this. A lot of times I close my eyes just because I don't want to be distracted. I, I'm very easily distracted. But you don't have to. Listen to what he says about this communion with God. The Holy Spirit, as a spirit of power, helps our infirmities in prayer. The Holy Spirit, as a spirit of life, ends our deadness in prayer, our communication with God. The Holy Spirit, as a spirit of wisdom, delivers us from ignorance in this holy art of communion with God. The Holy Spirit, as a spirit of fire, delivers us from the coldness in communicating with God. The Holy Spirit, as a spirit of might, comes to our aid in our weakness as we communicate with God. The Holy Spirit of God is with you. You go to the very last verse, of the very last chapter in the Bible, Rome, uh, at Revelation. ends like this, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. If you're here today, I'm convinced that you're here today, or if you're listening for some reason today or during the week, I'm convinced that the only reason that you're here or you will be listening is because the Spirit of God has drawn you to listen to this message. Because there's lots of messages going out. And God will draw people to different places where they need to listen to that message. This is not the only place where God speaks. God speaks all over in His fellowships, all over this community, all over this valley, these valleys, all over the world. But God led you here to listen to this message. As we always do at the end, I want you to close your eyes. And close your eyes, not to be holy, but close your eyes so there's no distraction there. And I'm going to ask you, what has God specifically spoken to you? Because many words have been spoken, but in reality, there's a very specific message God wants you to know. What is that message? Interact with God on that message right now, please.
Father, good news, the kind of news that, that feeds our souls, that's water to a dry land, the, the news that we long for because we've been designed to long for good news, sometimes seems too good to be true. That you, Lord Jesus, pour forth your grace on us. That you, Father, love us with an endless love. The way you love your Son, you love us. You, Holy Spirit, who has had constant communication in the Godhead, that you would include us in that and that you would communicate to us. That, that all sounds so far out there. It's too good for us to comprehend. But you can make it real to us. Father, the things that you have spoken to us may they take root in our hearts. May the things you've spoken to us grow us to understand you, that we turn our faces more and more towards you and more and more away from ourselves and the world, and that we truly will experience a transformation that comes by your grace, your love, and your fellowship. Thank you for the words that you infallibly put in scripture for us thank you that we can know and understand with assurance that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is there for us the love of God is there for us the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is there for us thank you for this amazing truth and we thank you so much in Jesus name Amen. For those of you who have joined us online, either right now as we're going through it or later on, we thank you so much for joining us and the Lord bless you because this news is good news for all God's children or for those that God is drawing to himself. So dwell on it. Don't, don't just run away and go on to watch a show. Dwell on the reality of what God has done. Thank you so much for joining us and Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.